Wow, Marilyn Monroe, episode number 39 of The Actors Room. This is going to be a good one. I went into this, okay, I'm going to talk about it after my little setup. So hang on real tight. We're going to be talking about Marilyn Monroe. Here we go. My name is Jeff Tarowski, and welcome back to another episode of The Actors Room. And like I said earlier, episode number 39. We're approaching 40. It's a milestone. I'm looking ahead, seeing 50, and going, wow, 50. But here we are, number 39. And before we get started talking about Marilyn, I want to go ahead and let you know. I've said it in the past. I have put a donate button on my website. So if you want to support the show, please go on there on my website, theactorsroom.lipson.com. And it's right there on the first page to the right, a little button. And you can go and click on that and go ahead and donate a dollar if you can. It would really help the show. I would appreciate it. My brother, who is becoming more involved in the show, he would appreciate it a lot too. So wanted to go ahead and point that out real quick. Uh, I also have a Twitter account at Actors Room, and I have a Facebook page. You go on to Facebook, and all you have to do is put in the Actors Room, and I come up. And you could go on there. I have pictures of all my shows, although I have to be honest with you, I'm a little behind on that with Facebook, and I'm kind of into Instagram right now. Um, I heard that Instagram can really help out a business, and I said, Okay, I'll give it a try. So this past week, I have set up an Instagram account. And it's really nice. I actually like Instagram a million times better than Twitter. Maybe a billion, okay? Yeah, about a billion times more. Instagram is simple. Uh, You have to use your phone a lot in order to post pictures and things like that, which is kind of a pain in the ass. But that's the only pain. I'm able to get into contact with a lot of actors on Instagram easier than I can with Twitter, I find. Uh, So I think it's really great for this show. Check out Instagram and look up the Actors Room, and I'm on there too. So putting that all aside, let's go ahead. And I got to tell you, I have been just blown away this week. I always wanted to look up Marilyn Monroe. I don't know that much about her. And to be quite honest with you, through time of me learning about acting, appreciating films older actors, any actor. Um, I always shied away from her movies because I have seen a few and I consider them okay. Um, But for the most part, and it was a long time ago, I watched these movies. Like when I was a kid, I watched them. Um, And I didn't really get that feeling of, oh, I should look into her more in the future. I just didn't get that. So throughout my Um, teens and my 20s, 30s, and now that I'm in my 40s, um, I thought to myself, why not give her some attention? I think she deserves it because, my gosh, like I've stated in the past, uh, when I lived in New York, she was all over the place. I mean, she is one hell of an image. And that's something that we should talk about. Marilyn Monroe, an icon. For sure. And I wanted to go ahead and do research on her. And just to start off the show. This is a quote from Marilyn. Quote. I don't want to be rich. I want to be loved. End of quote. Marilyn Monroe had a rough childhood. I did not know this. And like I said. I didn't know much at all about her. Uh, From what I had in my head about her. I felt, oh, she's just ditzy. Uh, She's all about her looks. And maybe she slapped her way to the top. You know, these things happen. And I think that played a little bit into her story. And I'll get into that later. But I just felt that she was an overrated actress. Period. And I left it at that. But when I read up on her, I found out some really great stuff. 
She was truly a deep person. There was a lot going on with her, and I can't wait to discuss it with you in the actor's room. Once again, my name is Jeff Tarowski, and here we go. June 1st, 1926, at Los Angeles County Hospital, Marilyn Monroe was born. Her real name is actually Norma Jean Mortensen. She was the third child of Gladys Pearl Baker. Now, Monroe's early childhood is confusing and fucked up. And please try to follow me as I try to explain it. All right? So here it is. Before Marilyn was born, her mom married a man named John Newton Baker. She was 15 and he was 24. They had a son and a daughter together before getting divorced. So her mom, before having Marilyn, okay, had two kids previously in a marriage that ended. And they had two children, a daughter and a son. So the father, John, took the two children with him to Kentucky, which is strange. Usually there's a divorce, okay? Usually the kids stay with the mom. Maybe that's the way it is now, but maybe back then it was different. So divorce happened. And the father decided to take the kids, move away to Kentucky. So Marilyn's mom was now alone again. No marriage, no kids. Wipe the slate clean. <laughs> right? we, she pretty much did wipe the slate. So that's interesting. So her mom, Gladys, pretty much lost her two children. She did. Gladys would go on to marry again. This time to a man named Martin Mortensen. This didn't last long at all. Their marriage ended after a few months. Then two years later, Marilyn was born, and the identity of her father was unknown. Now, I guess when Monroe became famous, she discovered who her father really was, and his name is Stanley Gifford. And I guess he worked with the mom. Now, Gladys, Marilyn's mom, wanted to get into the film business. She found it fascinating. But she was not successful. She ended up working in the film editing. Uh, She would splice film together. That's how close she got. Um, And so when she was working in the film industry, she met this guy who also worked in the studio. They were messing around. And they weren't married. And Gladys got pregnant with Marilyn. And Marilyn wanted to get in touch with, I think what's his name, Stanley, her real dad. And he had nothing to do with her. Even said, uh, if you want to talk to me any further, you're going to have to talk to my attorney. What a fucking asshole. What a great dad. Good for you, man. I hope you're proud of yourself. And I'm sure he's dead now. I hope you were proud of yourself, dick. Ah, that stuff pisses me off. Deadbeat dads. Duh, man. Mm. Okay. I'm sure that really... It had to just touch touch that soft spot in you. Uh, Her wanting to get in touch with her father and feeling that it would fill gaps in her life and him turning her away. Now, this will end up being later on in her life and I'm kind of getting further into the future of Marilyn, which I shouldn't. So we're going to go back to when she was born. Okay, though Marilyn Monroe, and I'm going to stop calling her that right now, Because at this point in her life, when she's born, her name is Norma, Norma Jean. So Norma Jean, her childhood, her early childhood was actually happy. Uh, And I'll tell you why. She saw very little of her mother. Her mother was crazy. Uh, She would slip into bouts of insanity from time to time and slowly, slowly drifting away. And her mom was mentally unstable. She had Norma Jean living with foster parents because she just couldn't handle being a full-time mom. She worked long hours as a film cutter for Hollywood Studios and would eventually move into the city and see Norma Jean only on the weekends. Listen to this. The mother acted more like a visitor in the home and was annoyed with little Norma Jean when Norman would make noises as a kid. The mother would get aggravated 
when the child would turn pages of a book. Norma Jean would hide away when the mother was around, and that's really fucking sad. But Norma Jean did remember a few positives with her mother. One was the fact that the mom would, once in a while, take her to the cinema. And this is what Norma Jean loved the most. And the other thing that was positive about her mother was this picture that the mom kept in her room. The picture was of a jaunty-looking man with a lively smile and a Clark Gable mustache. And it was further explained that that was her father in the picture. And this made her happy. And she dreamt constantly about it. Because I think that she looked at that picture, identified it, uh, even though the, the picture... Uh, The man in the picture was a complete a-hole dickhead, and she didn't know that yet. Uh, But she had visions of this great man (laughs) that pushed her childhood something positive. That maybe, oh my God, this guy is out there, and that I'm going to find him someday. So sad. Okay, uh, moving on. So as a child, Norma Jean was watched by many different people. First, it was neighbors. Then it was co-workers. She even bounced around foster homes. It's confusing having many different people raise you. Your values are all fucked up because you have so many different opinions. And that has to be hard on a child. And it was hard on Norma Jean. Especially with an absent father and a mother that was losing her mind. Norma Jean would go on to say that her childhood was filled with confusion, being treated like a slave getting sexually molested, and even having her life threatened. She claims that her own grandmother tried to smother her with a pillow. She was lonely and scared. She found comfort in daydreaming. Her imagination took her away from her terror and her sadness. She saw herself to be a sexual being even from an early age, having deep thought about the issue. And it was also movies that filled the other gaps that she had. And she fell in love with the screen. As a child, she was fascinated by the human experience. Her favorite actress was Jean Harlow. And I believe that Harlow was an idol to Monroe. Just look at the similarities between the two of them. If you see a Harlow film and how she acted and looked, very similar to Norma Jean who became Marilyn Monroe, and it's really remarkable to see. One of the people that helped raise Marilyn, and her name was uh, Grace. Yeah, Grace. Now, she opened Marilyn's eyes to the thought of actually making it in show business. I think Grace saw her growing, maturing, and seeing how beautiful she was becoming. And because Norma talked about movies a lot, and actors, and actresses, She really did put um, a lot of uh, hope into Norma around this time. And that gave her a little something to shoot for. And it gave her confidence that, hmm, maybe this is something I can do in the future. Be an actress. Be a model. That could happen. And this Grace lady really helped her along that way in gaining confidence. A lot of young girls dreamt of being Jean Harlow. But Marilyn would go on to say that she dreamt the hardest. When Norma was 12 years old, she started wearing tighter clothes. Her body was maturing, and the schoolboys, workers, and other people took notice. And Norma loved the attention. She would go on to marry at the age of 16 to a man called James Doherty. It was a happy marriage for the most part in the beginning. Uh, So in the early 1940s, there was Norma, the good wife, taking care of her husband. She fed him, did the housework, and tried to make a pleasant home. And for the most part, she did. Uh, There's an interview I saw with this guy, James Doherty, that she was married to back in the 40s. And he spoke very highly of her and said that she was a good cook. I'd come home. Dinner would be on the table. Uh, She kept a lovely home, Did she cleaned, she uh, did the laundry, she did everything that a wife at that time did. Uh, I think that she looked at James and wanted to please him. 
uh, making a comfortable home, something that she didn't have. She looked forward to having kids. And what happened was James uh, had to go to the Korean War. And Norma was devastated. She did not want him to go. Uh, And because during her whole life, she just had people leaving her, abandoning her. And she pled with him, please don't go. Please don't go. And he's like, I have to. I'll be back. And she asked him and pleaded with him, if you have to go, give me something. And he said, what do you want me to give you? And she said, a child. Give me a child. That way I'll have a piece of you here with me. And I can raise him. And when you come back, there's going to be a beautiful boy or girl waiting for you to love. And I guess James thought about it for a few days and thought, you know, mm, I don't think this is such a good idea. Number one, uh, raising a kid on your own is not easy. Number two, I think you're too young. We're too young to have kids. Let's give it a few years. You know, think about it from a reality perspective. Be, you know, common sense. We're just not ready. This crushed her. She really wanted to have a child with him and he denied it. Went off to war. So she did the best she could in order to help out with the war effort. And she worked at a factory. And I'm trying to see here. Um, I think that she worked at this factory. Okay. And there was this photographer walking around. Taking pictures of women. Working. Helping out the war effort. That sort of thing. And Norma caught his eye. And I guess would end up spending three days with her taking all sorts of pictures of Marilyn doing things around the factory and she just was very natural in front of the camera and this guy was impressed she was even giving him advice about certain things uh, not only about the way she stood or uh, you know things like that but the way she should act and the way he should hold the camera and she really kinda was a prodigy as far as performing and cameras which I thought was pretty cool And another note I have here before I move on is that this interview I saw with James Doherty, he said this, and I thought this was fascinating. He said, quote, I never knew Marilyn Monroe. I only knew Norma Jean, end of quote. And the reason why I wanted to put that quote in there is that she changed a lot from Norma Jean, the housewife, to Marilyn Monroe. And he was kind of blown away about how she changed that much. Like, I can't believe that my wife, okay, was this big movie star. Now she wasn't his wife anymore, but he was at one she was at one point. And when she was having her pictures taken by this photographer in the factory, it really opened her eyes to stardom in a way. Uh, doing something in the arts, uh, being a model, this excited her. It it made her feel important. So when James came back from the war, she continued doing this, modeling. And James was like, I don't know about this. I don't feel good about it. Because here you have, she was starting to get pictures of herself uh, put in magazines. And the guys would be like, James, is that your wife? He's like, yeah. (laughs) Okay, now everybody's looking at my wife. And I would feel the same way, I think. I wouldn't want my wife on the cover of magazines and shit. It pissed me off in a way. I mean, uh, I don't want other guys looking at my wife. And I think that's what he was feeling. And it reached a certain point where she was not cooking and cleaning like she used to. And she was off modeling and doing other things. And he's like, okay, there's a choice you're going to have to make. Our marriage or your modeling career. And she said, modeling career. Sorry, James. So there you go. She made the choice. And hey, that was the right choice for her. Uh, She could have said, okay, I'll stop modeling and be, you know, a mess and depressed the rest of her life. But she decided that she wanted to go ahead and do something for herself. She felt that, hey, I can be independent and be on my own doing something, modeling, maybe even down the road, being an actress. The camera would give her an identity. And this is what she wanted all along. Norma Jean became a student of projection. She wasn't like other models. She gave herself to the lens. Here's an interesting quote from a photographer who worked with her at this time. Quote, Her hours passed in a state of dreaminess that left her oblivious of the environment. 
and this began to irritate people. End of quote. She did plenty of reading and really concentrated on works of Shelley and Keats. She was educating herself. Norma Jean would date several men at a time, and she took great interest in all of them. She was getting something intellectual out of them. After a year of modeling, she signed her first movie contract in 1947. And this is where she changed her name to Marilyn Monroe. Monroe is her mother's maiden name. And Marilyn is her grandmother's middle name. So a little history about her name. She was worried about becoming an actress. Now, she studied acting, dancing, and singing, but showed very little promise at first. But she knew that it was there inside, this gift. It was deep down, like a secret, that she just didn't want to let out just yet. It had to be a slow thing coming, she thought. It'll come to the surface when it's ready. Um, it was during this time uh, that she was told by someone that she looked too common. I guess the girl said, you look too girl next door. Look, wait, I said that wrong. Wait, too girl next door? Does that make any sense? You know, I, I wrote that down and I made sure. Uh, too girl next door. Okay, she looked like a girl next door, which means she looked, you know, common, I guess. I would disagree. I've seen pictures of her when she was younger. I thought that she looked beautiful back then too. But I think that maybe they just wanted to switch some things up. So her face and her figure, they said, were pleasing. Pleasing. I love that. It was pleasing. Very pleasing. Okay. It was. It was very pleasing. But anyways, uh, they said it was sometimes provocative, but not yet compelling as perfect sexual shape. End of quote. What a weird quote. That's why I would have put it. What a weird quote that is. That last part. But not yet compelling as perfect sexual shape. All right. We're moving on. She had to work on her smile. And you can notice her wavering lips at times in her work. She worked on that shit. Monroe also changed her hair. Her natural hair color is actually, or was actually, light brown. And the length of her hair was long when she was younger. Well, they cut it short and made the decision to change the color of her hair to bleached honey blonde. She completely changed her look. And next came her demeanor. Her identity was specific and she had a role to play. Now, she wasn't quite sold on this new appearance that she had going on. I mean, it was a complete transformation. It really was. Um, but it was explained to her that she had to do something drastic to grab the attention of the studios. Incredible. I just find this stuff so incredible. I mean, this is a glimpse, a real glimpse, okay, how things really were back then. She looked too plain Jane, right? So let's spice her up, make her look incredibly uh, you know, sexy. <laughs> because that's how you're going to get work. Let's just be honest. Man. Just can't get it on talent, right? No, you got to do something like that. Completely change yourself. So she did. Okay, to kick off her film career, she appeared in several films as an extra. Then got a brief small role in a movie called Scudda Who, Scudda Hey. But her scene was cut. With no big success in the films that she was in, the studios decided to cancel her contract. She would keep taking acting classes and also played a few stage roles, but did not make much of an impression. Now, friends described her as someone displaying low self-esteem, and she needed constant support. She also attended the Actors Lab with Shelley Winters. Now, Winters would go on to remark that Marilyn felt she wasn't good enough to be in acting school. She just wasn't there yet in her process. She did a film with Groucho Marx called Love Happy in 1949. And it's kind of funny. I watched it. I liked her in it. She has good comedy. And it showed in this early work when a movie called Love Happy came out in 49 with Groucho Marx. And uh, there was an actor by the name of Clark Gordon that recalled this about Monroe as they were reading a scene together. 
the two of them were reading the scene and she was visibly shaking. The pages she held could barely stay in her hands. She was so nervous, she had to grab onto this guy's arm to keep from falling. She was virtually unknown at this point in her career, but later on down the line, you would see Marilyn on posters advertising this movie called Love Happy because she was such a big star later on. They put her on the poster. Um, Offset, friends remarked how Marilyn was good at making people feel sorry for her. She was protecting herself. She had sheer terror. It seems she's attracted to smart, older men. Looking for a father figure, I think. She then met a few mentors named John Carroll and Lucy Ryman and got her next film project. And this was called Asphalt Jungle with Sterling Hayden and James Whitmore. Now I want you to listen to this tidbit about this movie. Here it goes. John Houston, who's a director, is an avid horseman. Uh, He had a team of Irish stallions boarded and trained at MGM talent executive uh, Lucy Ryman Carroll's Ranch. And this is the lady that will become uh, Marilyn's mentor. So John Houston, the director, had a bunch of horses at her ranch okay it's gonna set up what i'm gonna get to all right and he happened to be eighteen thousand dollars in debt with the ranch so he owed these people money um on a sunday afternoon in september carol and her husband invited houston out to the ranch and made him an offer he couldn't refuse to borrow a line from another movie okay i just did that did you catch that okay from Godfather. Okay, we're moving on here. Uh, Carol informed Houston that if he did not allow Monroe another shot at the role, the ranch would sell his stallions and collect the money due. Houston did not refuse the terms, and Monroe got another screen test. Only this time, she had the support of Louis B. Mayer and MGM chief hairstylist Sidney Gularoff. When Fox chief Daryl F. Zanuck saw the film, he again assumed her contract. So just stepping back for a little bit was kind of long-winded. But I want to point out a few things. John Houston was a director, okay, of a movie she wanted to be in called Asphalt Jungle. She got the role, but she didn't get it right off the bat. John Houston wanted somebody else. Well, her mentors pretty much convinced him, listen, do us a favor, okay? We're going to, you know, forget about your debt uh, and all that stuff if you let Marilyn be in the movie. And he said, oh, okay, all right. It worked out fine. But I wanted to, to do that, that little quote or whatever, okay, into this episode because show business is like that. I'm sorry, folks, it is. I think that a lot of people feel that there's a chance that that stuff doesn't exist. It does. 100%. It's all about who you know, who you're shaking hands with, who you're doing favors for, and if you're talented enough, you get to stay. There you go. Okay, we're moving on. Her next film that I want to talk about, All About Eve, 1950. Her castmate in the film, Celeste Holm, is jaded. When discussing Monroe, she would complain about how Marilyn would keep people waiting to do her scene. She felt her to be selfish in that way. This was actually a very nice performance by Monroe. Um, Upon viewing her, I noticed how playful she is. I like that about actors. And I'm getting past the image she portrays a little bit at this point. And I guess it really, truly became her. The Marilyn Monroe character, okay, there's a lot of Norma Jean in there. There is. Uh, It's just her looking different. Uh, She really did have that soft-spoken voice. I always thought that was bullshit. I just, for some reason, I'd like, that's just BS. She doesn't talk like that. But she did. She had, I guess she had a soft voice like that. That's the way she talked. 
uh, I guess it wasn't BS, so bad on me. Uh, thank God I'm doing this research on these people, learning about them, because, you know, I'm glad I'm being proved wrong on some things, because you learn, you live and learn. I like that stuff. There is no doubt that she has a quality, a glow to her, um, but others would wonder if she had the will. It seems she got the dumb blonde roles, yes, but she added something to it. Johnny Hyde became a big part of her life at this time. Now, Hyde was 30 years older, married, and a talent agent. He was very instrumental in getting her into films. Um, And I want to kind of dive into this a little bit. He fell for her, this Hyde guy, hard. Loved her. It made it pretty clear, even to his wife. Um, I know. (laughs) What? Uh, but he f- he felt that he could do all he can do to get Marilyn into the business and not only get her in the business, but get her to stay. I guess he would go and pay for her plastic surgery. Uh, he would have her live with him, I guess, at one point. I think he left his wife at one point because of Marilyn and they lived together. She was leading him on, though. She didn't see him in that way. Um, at least she was honest about it. And said, listen, John, not going to happen. I'll be your good friend. And I'm thankful for what you're doing for me. Uh, And boy, did he help her out. Uh, Gave her a lot of great advice. uh, Got her to meet the right people. uh, Opened a lot of doors for her in the business. And because of this, she got a film called Clash by Night. Now this film got her going in the right direction. She was stepping into her future. And Johnny Hyde was a big part of that. Now, in 1952, a film called Don't Bother to Knock was next. This was a different kind of role, and it was critically acclaimed. Each role after this movie made her a bigger and bigger star. Niagara, next up, had the Kiss Me song. Now that was a moment. Her next film, Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, This is when she exploded. She went kaboom after this movie. And not only is it good, it's funny. Um, Chinese theater, okay, is uh, where these big stars go and they have their hands imprinted into the cement and their hand is forever in the cement. Well, she got a chance to do this at this point in her career. Excuse me. I always thought this was a, a, a pretty interesting, sweet moment for Monroe when she was doing that. She put her hands in the, in the ground and she, she takes them out and she's just kind of wiggling her hands and smiling. She looks so happy. And from a lot of footage that I've seen of Marilyn, she did look happy. And you never got to see those, I don't know, that unhappiness that she had going on deep, deep inside. But it, it really looked like she was happy at that moment. Truly happy. Uh, She was getting a lot of fan adoration at this time. And uh, it was also said by her friend that she never wore underwear. Woo! And Joan Crawford, another older actress back then, didn't like her. And uh, and I never liked Joan Crawford. She was that actress that was uh, kind of a bitch. And she, like, beat her children. Or that's what's, you know, a claim that she beat her kids in that movie called Mommy Dearest. That movie always scared the crap out of me when she took out those uh, uh, hangers, those wire hangers, and she was beating her kids. She didn't like Monroe. Well, guess what? I don't like you. And I'm sure Monroe didn't like you either. Okay. Minnie felt that Monroe was changing values on sexuality, and Hugh Hefner validated this. Next up is Marry a Millionaire. And, um... It's about fuzzy eyesight. She was like running into doors and things like that. Um, playing the dumb blonde. And, you know, I, once again, uh, thinking that she has great comic timing. Uh, that's something that's hard to learn. You either have it or you don't. And she had it. Um, and she had a, an excellent persona. Um, made bad jokes at her expense. I have written down here. A lot of people made bad jokes at her expense. I feel that it was just, she was an easy target to pick on. And I think she just put up with it. And she really wanted to be taken seriously. In the end, 
She felt it was coming. They're going to take notice of me and treat me with respect. Uh, the next movie I want to touch on is called River of No Return. And this she starred with Robert Mitchum. And Robert Mitchum knew her way back in the day when she wasn't even famous yet. Got to know her and he really respected her. Uh, and they were pretty good friends and he has nothing but great things to say about her. Uh, the movie itself is cliche. And, uh, and I have here a note that Mitch deeply cared for her. And he did. Um, hold on one second. I got my notes here like all jumbled up. Uh, I have some notes. It's really funny. I have some notes that are on, uh, um, you know, a Word document that I printed out real nice. And uh, ran out of time at work. You know, it, this getting slowing down. It's slowing down at work right now. So I've been having more time concentrating on some actors, doing research. And I thought for sure this Friday, which was yesterday for me, I would have plenty of time to wrap up my research on Maryland. I mean, I knew for sure I was going to have at least two hours. At least. So I go in there Friday. And when I get there, it's really slow. I'm like, this is great. I'm going to wrap this up. Maybe I'll even get a chance to like start on a new actor. You know, I'm like, fuck yeah. So I sit down. First couple minutes, great. And all of a sudden it gets busy. I'm like, okay, it'll slow down. Nope, it didn't slow down. I'm like, what the fuck? And Fridays are usually slow. Not this Friday. I may even ha- act- actually have to go into work. I hate when I stutter. I fucking hate that. So I'm, my, my brain is getting stupid. I hate that. Ah, all right. So anyway, I may have to go in on Sunday too. Can you believe that? It's supposed to be like slow time. Got all these big projects and everything. So anyway, I have this Word document printed out. Looks great. But because I run out of time, I had to do the rest of my research last night. And I have it all written down longhand. So if the last part of the show sounds a lot different from the first half, it's because I'm reading off of paper that I wrote longhand. Uh, my, <laughs> my penmanship sometimes, I can't even read it myself. It's like chicken scratch. Um, so bear with me if I sound like an idiot sometimes. I don't mean to. I'm just going to try to get through this and uh, do a great show. And here we go, moving forward. Um, I, I felt that Monroe always looked sexy, didn't she? I mean, always. Even when she didn't have makeup on. And to be honest with you, I think some women look better without makeup than with makeup. My wife is a perfect example. She looks better without makeup. So to me, I think that some women just have natural beauty. They look naturally beautiful. You don't need makeup all the time. Sometimes you do, but not all the time. Monroe always looked good. I mean, just the way she walked looked good. Talked, that sexy talk and everything. Although I thought it was fake. It's not. It's real. And uh, she just did. Always looked good. Um, it's also noted here, uh, she starts to show up late on the set. And this would be a trend with her. Um, she would always show up late and for one reason or another. And this started to become a trend at this time. Also, at this time, she married Joe DiMaggio. Weird couple. I'm sorry, DiMaggio, not that much of a looker. But hey, he was a baseball player, right? That's cool. That's sexy. And Monroe married him in 1954. Uh, She also battled the studios at this time and was suspended. She was getting tired of certain projects they were giving her. She was getting fed up. So she decided to not show up. (laughs) So they said, you're suspended. She's like, fine. So her and DiMaggio got married and she went off, I think, for a little while to be a wife to Joe and all that stuff. But she's, this is not her. She's Marilyn Monroe. You know, she, she, she wants to be a star. You know, she wants to keep going with her career. And in doing so, Joe DiMaggio was always jealous of this. The jealous of just having Marilyn as a wife, having guys look at her all the time. And it just made him very uncomfortable. And he just wasn't used to being second fiddle. Now, the next movie that she would do is called No Business Like Show Business. And she stole the show. DiMaggio hated show business. 
and would not be happy about it. He wouldn't cooperate. He wouldn't even go along with her on certain projects. Like she would ask him to come with her. And he's like, no, I'm going to stay home. I don't want to be there. So here's the early stages of a divorce coming right around the corner. <laughs> um, next movie up, Seven Year Itch. Um, it solidified her sex status, I have written here. Okay. Uh, the movie is about a married man trying to keep from hooking up with Marilyn because she's so hot. She was like, I think she, she didn't even have a name in the movie. She was the girl, the really sexy girl that lived upstairs and in the apartment, you know, and she would hang around this guy, flirting with him, going to movies with him. And this is the movie where she walks out and stands over that grate and it blows up her dress. And DiMaggio was freaking pissed about this. And uh, yeah, that was an image or is an image that a lot of people know. For Marilyn, her skirt blowing up and it's sexy, but it's, um, I don't know, derogatory in a way. Is that the right word? Uh, a shame. I don't know. I would be ashamed if that was my wife, I guess. Um, should she feel ashamed that she even did that? I don't know. I mean, it wasn't disgusting or anything, um, but it's an image that you probably don't want people to remember you by. I don't know. It, Hey, leave comments on the show if you think I'm wrong. I'd be happy with any comments on the show, by the way, on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram now. All right. Uh, on the website, you can go on my website, theactorsroom.lipson.com. I have all my shows on there. And you can leave comments after the show. Okay. Or not after the show. But they have a little comment section. You can leave, Jeff, you're an idiot. I, I don't think that that image is uh bad or good it is what it you know call me a hey jeff you got a date wrong hey idiot what are you doing in this podcast you're studying you're studying you're stuttering studying i study my actors and then i stutter all right get it right but anyways seven year itch was was good and that was the movie where the skirt blows up and you get to see a lot of her leg a lot of her leg and she said that she had to wear um, two pairs of underwear. She usually doesn't wear any underwear. But for this movie, she put on two pairs of underwear just to be safe. It is also rumored that Joe DiMaggio abused her. Now, I don't know how he abused her, but the studio had to step in and sort of say, um, this is not working out between the two of you. Uh, so either he was hit- hitting her, uh, physically abusing her, or just mentally abusing her. But in any sense, uh, he was hurting her. Dick. Now, Monroe is crushed that this union was not working. Only married for less than a year. Didn't even make a year. Um, she turned down a film and got suspended. She decided that she'd go and participate in the actor studio. She was kind of getting tired of doing movies, uh, not being taken seriously, that she wanted to really study acting. So she went to the actor's studio and only watched at first. Didn't do the classes yet. She was just an observer. And Lee Strasberg, the man who ran this studio, uh, is great at internal examination. And she wanted to learn this. Uh, And she became part of the Strasberg family. Started gaining respect and then um, wanted to be taken seriously in what she was doing. And Strasbourg, I think, helped her with that. Fox Studios wanted her back badly. So badly, they gave her a new contract. And she also had script approval and she could also pick her director if she wanted to. Now, she started a relationship at this time. With Arthur Miller, the author. And once again, an older guy. And not that attractive. Man, we all could have had a shot with her. Man, damn it. Isn't that something? Not that I was around back then. I'm just saying that. You know, if I was at that uh, time period, I could have had a shot with Marilyn Monroe. It was not out of the realm of possibility. I would have had it been much older. Okay. 
and uh, not that good looking. And she would have been like, hey, here's my number. Oh, uh, I'm getting stupid. But anyways, Arthur Miller, right? Arthur Miller. Well, I don't mean to make fun of it because this is the scoop. She was attracted to these older men because of this father figure that she never had and always wanted. And I think that she felt that she can learn something from guys like Arthur um, and uh, get something back from that relationship that she had gaps in herself. Gaps that she felt that Arthur could fill. Now, her next movie was called Bus Stop. I think this is probably her best performance. But it exposed her worst fears. It challenged her. And I think that her being challenged and her studying at the actor's studio opened up doors in herself. Made it good for her performance, yes. But it opened up doors that maybe she didn't want to open. You know, stuff that gets locked away, you lock it. You know, you throw away the key and then it's, it's over. Well, the actor's studio likes to open doors, be like, hey, remember this? And you go, oh my god. Well, this was happening to Marilyn at this time. Good for her career, right? But bad for, like, personal stuff. So she started taking pills. Sleeping pills. So I guess Strasberg, the director at the actor studio, told the director of the movie, Josh Gordon, that Marilyn was the best student he ever had. Isn't that something? Interesting. Hmm. Now, I felt the character was much like her. And kind of like the way Brando was in Last Tango in Paris. Same here with Monroe. Uh, She was using her own inner life. Now, her insecurities, they took their toll during this movie. And like I said, drugs became a part of her life. I feel that Strasbourg's technique introduced her. To bring up these inner demons. Dangerous for some actors. An example is River Phoenix. I think the same thing happened to him. Her performance gained acclaim. National acclaim. And then she decided to marry Arthur Miller in 1956. She was intrigued on what he could teach her. Next movie called Prince and the Showgirl with Laurence Olivier. Now, Olivier had no patience at all with Monroe and her method. She was not well. Uh, She had to have, I guess, Lee Strasberg's wife, okay? She was also involved with the actor's studio. I guess Monroe had to have her on the set all the time to be like a coach, coach her up, uh, keep her upright, that sort of thing. And this annoyed Olivier. It's like, what the hell is this? (laughs) You know? He was finding that he had no respect for her. And the film bombed because the two of them, Olivier and Monroe, zero chemistry. In 1957, Monroe suffered a miscarriage. And uh, this kind of, it really affected her. I mean, it would affect any woman you're looking forward to having a child. Uh, Her and Arthur Miller uh, kept trying and trying to have kids. Uh, She got pregnant. And she miscarried. And um, this also reminded Marilyn and being haunted in a way by her mother's insanity. And she felt, God, I hope it doesn't happen to me. Her next movie called Some Like It Hot was next with Jack Lemon and Curtis. Now, she didn't want to do this movie. And, uh, Curtis, when I said Curtis, that's uh, Tony Curtis. Uh, Tony Curtis said, kissing Monroe was like kissing Hitler. She was that gone at this point. Like, I don't even think that mentally she was around. And it showed in her, the way she acted alongside her fellow actors and did the scenes with them. And Tony Curtis felt that she just wasn't there. Uh, And she was just somewhere else. Um... She was in bad shape. Uh, She forgot her lines. Her pills that she was taking were now taking over her. Uh, She had chronic fatigue. She wasn't sleeping. Uh, And being hooked on pills, uh, the downers, the doctors then prescribed her uppers. So she was constantly on pills. 
because if she was too up, she'd take a pill to come down. And when she was too down, she would take a pill to pick herself back up. A vicious cycle. And uh, because of this, she had another miscarriage. And uh, Some Like It Hot was the biggest movie that she ever had. She was disconnected. And it was showing in her life and in her films. Her marriage to Miller was falling apart. So Miller decided, Arthur decided to be involved with her next project called The Misfits. Uh, Miller wrote it. And it was directed by John Huston. Eli Wallach was in it. Clark Gable. And also Monty Clift who was going through some shit at this time. This, this guy was a hardcore. Monty, hardcore into drugs and alcohol. I mean, he was constantly on something. And it was hard stuff. Um, so I'm sure that was a blast on that movie. My God. Clark Gable was also um, on to the later, later. The later part of his life. I'll probably cut that out. If not, I'll keep it in. <laughs> oh, God. My mouth is like getting dry. You know, I've been here for over an hour now. In my little room, my voice is starting to feel it. It is feeling it. And uh, I haven't had water. I just got done cutting the lawn. You know, I have a house, as you know. Got some grass I had to cut. So uh, I'm still kind of thirsty from that. And now I keep talking and talking. So I apologize if my voice is waning and uh, sounding like shit. But anyways, Clark Gable was getting up in age at this point. And he had to put up with this BS. Monroe showing up late. Or not even showing up at all. And Cliff just being completely wasted probably. All the time. Um, quite simply. Monroe was being unprofessional. And Gable was frustrated with her. Uh, and showed signs that he would have a heart attack soon. And he did. Uh, Gable died shortly after the movie. And Monroe felt guilty about this and felt she caused his death (laughs) whoa wow I mean that is heavy stuff man oh man I mean I'm reading up about this stuff I had no idea about this shit I just had no idea that this stuff was going on this is interesting stuff very fascinating character Marilyn Monroe now her and Arthur Miller divorced soon after this and The movie The Misfits bombed. From here on out, Monroe's life is a downward spiral. Depression. And she ended up being institutionalized in 1961. And there you go. She was now convinced she was turning into her mother. Because her mother lost her mind. And ended up in in an institution. And now Marilyn was ending up the same way. And at this time, Joe DiMaggio actually became a part of her life again. I think he felt bad about the way it ended, the way it did. I don't think he hit her, but I think that they argued a lot and it just wasn't healthy for the relationship. Well, he helped her during this time, became a part of her life as a friend and was there for her. Um, and uh, she also socialized with the Rat Pack at this time. You know, Dean Martin, Frank Sinatra, all those guys. And got involved with President Kennedy. I didn't want to dive too much into this. Because there really isn't a lot. Uh, They weren't like. um, Passionately. In a love romance. That wasn't the case people. Okay. They fooled around. It's as simple as that. John Kennedy. President of the United States. Felt that Marilyn Monroe was attractive. And wanted to have sex with her. So he did. End of story. That's it. I couldn't find too much about it. And all those people that think that it's some conspiracy with her and the Kennedys, there wasn't. Keep dreaming. It just it just wasn't there. Okay. All right. Her next movie called Something Has Gotta Give. Okay, with Dean Martin. It was a mess. A complete mess. She only showed up for 13 days out of the 30-day shoot. But Dean Martin absolutely adored her and fought for her. And they wanted to fire her. 
And he's like, just keep with it. She's going through a rough time. You know, I uh, don't, it's don't take it personally. You know, but they're like, well, yeah, well, you know what? We are taking it personally. She's a horrible, horrible professional. We can't take it anymore. And I mean, it was really a big deal. You know, um, Monroe, he, she just couldn't focus anymore. She was gone. Um, and, uh, she just at one point stopped showing up. Um, and, uh, I wanted to have this little tidbit in here, uh, in this movie, when she did show up, she was acting alongside a couple of kids. I would say eight, nine years old kids. Well, she loved acting alongside with them because of the fact that she wanted to have kids of her own, you know, and messed up as her childhood was, she really did want to have kids and bring them up the right way, be a good mom, something that, you know, her mom wasn't. And so she had a good time on set with them, uh, playing with them. And it also brought up the fact that, uh, you know, she just couldn't have kids, it seemed. Going through all these miscarriages. And it even sank her deeper into depression. Um, and after this, shortly after this, she performed for Kennedy's birthday party. Where she sang happy birthday. That scene always just disturbed me. It just looked like she was high as a kite. And it was awkward. And it was. This exact when I did my research, that's exactly what it was. It was awkward. It was weird. It was creepy. Uh, the way she sang "Happy Birthday," it's creepy. I'm sorry, it is. It's creepy. And she was com- she was completely drugged up. She didn't want to do it. I guess the MC, uh, you know, running this show, this birthday party, this weird birthday party. I guess that went on for hours and hours. Well, I guess Monroe didn't want to come out. And this guy kept being like, well, Marilyn's going to come out, everybody. Give her a round of applause. And, she, and he would finally go, and here's Marilyn Monroe. Crickets. Crickets. She didn't come out. And he'd be like, okay, we'll tell a few more jokes. <laughs> so we could tell a few more jokes. And then once again, I, she's here this time. Marilyn Monroe. Crickets. Crickets. Okay. Um, we're going to check on her, see if she's okay. And this went on a few more times. And she finally came out, stumbling around, came up to the microphone, looking just like a complete train wreck, in my opinion. She didn't look all there. And that song that she sang, I'm sorry. Uncomfortable. Uh, Okay, like I said, looked stoned. And she was horrified. Pathetic. The mo- and not on her part. Not on her part. Now, she was a mess at this time. I thought it was pathetic they brought her out like that. I'm sorry. How dare you? She was not well at that time. And you wanted her to come out and sing to Kennedy. Like, in that state. Take a look at her. At that state. Unacceptable to me. She dies soon after this. Got a little emotional there. Do my research on her. I fell in love with her a little bit. She went through some shit. I. She did. I have. Nothing but high respect. For her now. And and if there's a movie I've not seen of hers. I'm going to see it. Now we're going to talk about. Her death. Just for a bit. This is the statement. That was released. By the people. After the autopsy. Here it is. Quote. Miss Monroe had suffered from psychiatric. 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 Miss Monroe had suffered from psychiatric disturbance for a long time. She experienced severe fears and frequent depressions. Mood changes were abrupt and unpredictable. Among symptoms of disorganization. Sleep disturbance was prominent. For which she had been taking sedatives. You know what? Fuck that. Hear that? Not only am I finding it hard to read. Because it's just poorly written. We're going to toss that over there. I'm just going to sum it up. I did my research on it. Basically this is what happened. She was going through her day. Uh, I don't know if she was suicidal throughout the day. I think it just kind of led up to that. Um, uh, There were some people coming in and out of her house that day. And uh, she was taking drugs. And uh, the evening was wrapping up. 
And I think she was on the phone with one of her friends, another actor. And during the conversation, she sounded completely out of it. It said something like, uh, I just want to say goodbye to you, so on and so forth. They think his name was John, but if it wasn't, we'll just call him John. I just want to say goodbye to you, John. Oh, and tell uh, so-and-so I said goodbye <clears throat> as well, and um, I'm going to go now. Goodbye. And the actor that she was talking to was like, that was a weird conversation. And so he wanted to look into it further. Uh, called up the housekeeper that was with Monroe that day and asked her, listen, I want you to check on Marilyn. See if she's okay. Please do that for me. So she did. Uh, she checked up on her, came back to the phone and said, uh, I think she's fine. Uh, she seems to be okay. We had a conversation. Um, so please put your fears to rest. Everything's okay. So the guy hung up the phone, felt that, okay, she's, she's okay. Well, I think it was around 8 o'clock that night. Uh, the housekeeper left Monroe and did her thing in the house. And I got the, the impression that she woke up in the middle of the night, the housekeeper, at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning with, like, something's wrong. Went to Monroe's uh, bedroom and saw a light on and, and Monroe was dead on the floor. Uh, autopsy reports say that she died somewhere between 8.30 and 10 o'clock. And so she lay there for a little while. And uh, all these conspiracy theories that she was killed, murdered, a con- you know, conspiracy. I'm sorry, uh, I could not find anything about it. And I am conspiracy guy. So if I felt that there was something fishy, I would go into it more. Uh, but in my honest opinion, um, she took too many pills that night and uh, might have been suicidal at that point uh, in the day or the night. Um, I think it led up to that. And so she passed very young, very sad, very sad life, very exciting life. What an exciting life she led. And one thing I wanted to point out before I end this episode of Marilyn Monroe, and I can't believe I forgot this. She was instrumental in going out and entertaining the troops overseas. She would entertain thousands and thousands and thousands of soldiers. She would get up there and sing for them. And she says, she stated that that was the happiest she's ever been in her life. The adoration that she got from the soldiers and then doing something important like that. Like that meant a lot to those soldiers. Her being there, they missed home. They missed their families. They miss America. You know, and having her come out there and giving them some happiness. They were smiling. She looked out on those guys and every single one of them was smiling at her. The greatest time or part of her life. Beautiful stuff. What an episode. Although I stuttered a bit in this episode and I apologize for my notes. I got in what I wanted to get in with one part fascinating stuff. Do your own research on Monroe, okay, if you if you want. I think I put in a lot of good stuff. There's probably more I missed. Um, and if there's some really juicy stuff I left out, leave some comments on the boards. All right, everybody. Thanks for listening to this edition of The Actors Room, highlighting the beautiful, talented Marilyn Monroe. All right. Well, you know what I'm going to say next. You know what I'm going to say. I'm going to say this. Go out tonight to see a movie or stay in, put your feet up and put in a movie. One that you haven't seen in a while, maybe, right? I know the weather's getting nicer, so it'll be later on in the evening when the sun goes down or you don't want to have like a a bonfire in the back. Or if you're done with your bonfire, come inside, put in that movie. One that makes you feel good, right? Or... Maybe tonight, put in a scary movie. I might do that. Although, I'm going to have to watch it alone because my kids aren't old enough yet and my wife really isn't into that stuff. So I may have to do it alone, which isn't good. I get scared. But if you're with a group of people, maybe put in something scary tonight. Mix it up, right? You could put a scary movie in whenever. 
It doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be near Thanksgiving and Thanksgiving. Well, okay. Halloween. What an idiot. I don't even know how I get these episodes done sometimes. I think to myself, I'm... I don't know. Like, I'm a complete moron sometimes. Like, I'm even able to do research. Like, I'm even able to read. Like, oh my God, I can read. But anyways, thanks again for listening to The Actors Room. Put in that movie tonight. God bless you. Have a good one.